So thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm going to talk about sentiment analysis in context. Um, I did a great webinar last week, I guess, with Tyler and a few others, and that got these ideas rattling around inside my head, and so I thought it would be fun to revisit some of those themes, uh, some of my favorite themes from the topic of sentiment analysis. So to set the stage a little bit, I thought I would just uh, present two approaches you might take to sentiment analysis. So the first would be the task is predicting one of a handful of labels for text in isolation. That's probably the standard formulation in industry and in academia, right? Like, I give you a phrase or a sentence or a document, and you assign it positive, negative, or neutral. Right? You do that to the text in isolation, and the label set is very small. Now, that's obviously just an approximation of the full complexity of sentiment and emotional expression in language, but it's turned out to be a really useful approximation. And in particular, it's a kind of one-dimensional flatlander view of multifaceted meanings that we get from natural language. Uh, and it's a really useful dimension, right? You find pretty quickly that all the problems of natural language understanding, like negation and attitude description and modality and metaphor and other kinds of non-literal language use, those all end up uh, being relevant to that simple task of sentiment analysis. So that'd be like the compositional semantics angle on sentiment. I'm going to explore that second bullet, though. Here, we're predicting a mixture of emotional and social information for speech acts in context, right? So the two points of contrast there are first, probably gonna have a high dimensional label set, right? Not just three um, labels we wanna assign, but maybe a hundred. Uh, we also might not presuppose that each one of those texts has a unique label. It could be a mixture of different kinds of emotional information. And the second part is also important. Instead of doing this for texts in isolation, the idea conceptually is that we'll make these predictions about speech acts in context, so that'd be like, we care about who's talking, what they're talking about, who they're talking to, and so forth. And all of that information is brought to bear to the task of predicting what we want to predict, which is emotional information, emotional expression. So I'm going to talk about two papers. The first one is called Sentiment Expression Conditioned by Affective Transitions and Social Forces. It was done with this interdisciplinary group of people at Stanford. And here the, in the, the focus is it really on the fact that our emotional states are not things that we experience in isolation, but rather they follow predictable paths, right? Um, depression is associated with sadness, and you might rise from your depression out of sadness into a happier state. That's what this cartoon is meant to evoke here. On Monday, this character is depressed and in a, in a new place. The world, real world is impinging on this person's happiness. But as the week goes on, you get a kind of happy story with it. The point here is just that those affective transitions are happening in a predictable way, right? So you can already see that, assuming you believe me that these affective transitions have structure to them, we can do a better job at sentiment if we take that into account. So for our experiments, that's what we did. The data set that we were using is this very large collection of mood updates from the social networking site, The Experience Project, which is associated with Canjoya, which is the company just up there. Uh, here's, a, here's an example update. It says, I'm feeling thankful. For us, thankful is the label there, the mood update. And then it says, ah, such great friends. Thanks for the birthday presents. So we'll use the text surrounding that label, thankful, to predict that mood. There are about 130 moods that are well represented in this data set. Here's the, the, we study about two dozen in this paper, the top ones. So we have happy at the top there. Uh, that's the most well represented uh, mood followed by horny, which is a bit embarrassing, but I guess that reflects the human condition. And then you get uh, a whole mixture of other things that are positive and negative. All of those are of interest. I think they're all sort of irreducible in their own way. And I do want to point out, really interesting about this data set are the transitional emotions, like anxiety, hopefulness, optimism. These are you know, um, uncertain states in the sense that you don't quite know what's going to happen next in the way that you might if the state is happiness or depression. So to do this exploratory data analysis for this, we built a simple transition model, which is just measuring empirically from the mood data set what your likelihood is from going from one emotional state to another. And here's a summary of a, of a few of them. So at the top there, it says amused, anxious, blah, cheerful, and depressed. And then we have the nearest neighbors by these transition probabilities below them. So this is saying that if you're in an amused state, you're most likely to transition to bewildered, followed by artistic, curious, bouncy, and chill. Uh, anxious is more interesting. That's transitional. So you're most likely to transition to distressed. But down there, you also see disappointed, excited, bewildered, crushed, right? So 
from an anxious state, the outcome might be good, or it might be bad, or it might be confusing. Uh, that's just a glimpse. Here's the full network of all of the transitions with some color coding to indicate clusters of emotions. And I know, I wouldn't expect you to be able to read this, but you can see there's broad structure, like purple is depressed. And you're very likely to have transitions from there into the red, which is blah or annoyed. And you're very unlikely to have direct transitions from depressed into the happier states, like happy or amused or horny or excited. All right, so here's, a, here's a, some glimpse of the other thing. So like, um, from a worried state up here at the top, uh, you have lots of transitions into the purple and into the red and very few directly into happy, right? Just showing some structure there. This is hopeful down here at the bottom and it's really uncertain, right? You might transition from hopefulness into depression if your hopes are not realized or into happiness if they are. So you can think of like anxiety and optimism as also belonging to those categories. Oh, here's blessed, that's a core happiness thing. There are essentially no direct transitions transitions from blessed into sadness. You have to sort of transition through other parts in this network. So there's lots of structure there. And what we did experimentally is just show that we could do a better job at that textual task of predicting the mood update from the text if we modeled it as a sequence problem. So we considered sequence of mood, sequences of mood updates and made predictions at that level. And so you can think in the same way that you can do a better job at part of speech tagging by considering that as a sequence problem. Here too, if you're doing sentiment analysis, you should think of it as a sequence problem. So the other experiment that we did in this paper is very similar, except now we'll bring in a social dimension. And this, is maybe, this maybe has more relevance for the kind of things that you all do. So we were interested back in the rating setting, typical for sentiment analysis, how people are being influenced when they make a rating choice by the other people who have rated that same product. So here in this little cartoon, that guy is saying, hmm, well, I love this beer, but beer snob 82 thinks the nose is weak and he's an experienced user. I don't want to look naive, so I'll give it a 3.5 to be safe, right? So maybe this user was originally going to do five stars, but modeled the community and then it ended up at a different place. Uh, we use this great data set called Rate Beer, which we've used, uh, lots of us, in lots of papers. Uh, it's a massive collection of people writing short reviews of beers. And it's really interesting from the perspective of sentiment analysis because unlike most of these data sets, it is biased toward the neutral part of the scale. By and large, these data sets have a massive positive bias. But here, because of the social pressures, and in other contexts we've studied the kind of community effects of this site, people don't want to appear naive. They don't want to act like they hate, say that they hated a beer that the connoisseurs loved or loved a beer that the connoisseurs were lukewarm about. And all of this modeling comes together to push people toward the middle. So again, we have just a simple label set here. This is just positive, negative, and neutral. And you can see here, transitioning, if, if the previous review was positive, your review is also very likely to be positive, and so forth for neutral and negative. These are the full transition probabilities, and you can just see that that diagonal <coughs> is very dark. That's the most likely transition. So good hypothesis, people are being influenced by the previous reviews in the page that they're looking at. And you might worry that that's just a, an effect of like a global effect. Some products are, are good, some are bad, some are neutral. And these transition probabilities are just reflecting that global property of the, of the um, products. This middle one, that says high variance sequences. So this is the case where we know there's lots of disagreement in that forum, on that page, about how to rate the beer. And still we see lots of effects of the previous review on the current. And over here, you just contrast with what happens when you shuffle the data set and remove all that structure. So there was lots of information there. Again, the experimental setup was the same. It's a kind of minimal pair thing where we have the CRF, which is predicting um, sequences, uh, versus a Maxent model, which you can think of as the simplification of the CRF, where you have sequences of length one. So we put those in competition in the paper, and we find that the CRF is much better. Um, because it's able to capture all these social influences. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears now to a second paper, and this one I think pushes even deeper into the realm of understanding sentiment as a social problem. And this is a paper I did with some people in the info lab at Stanford. Bob West was the lead author. You're gonna see his face in a second. This was called Exploiting Social Network Structure for Person-to-Person -person Sentiment Analysis. 
question. So here's the pitch to you. Our data kind of looks like this, where we've got, this is Bob, Bob West in the corner. And I'm assuming that these are three professors, crazy professors that he found on the internet. I don't know who any of them are. Um, I did find these guys. That could be Bob's dad, but I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, the conceit of this little illustration is that after this talk, so Bob said all this stuff. He, he gave the talk just like I am now. And then these people commented on it. So this guy says, I actually kind of liked it. That's clearly a positive thing. Dude, that was even more boring than his gray shirt. I wore a gray shirt, too. Uh, so that's clearly negative. And then we have this case, yeah, right, great talk. He didn't even talk about deep learning, which, depending on your perspective, is either a ringing endorsement or a kind of sarcastic <laughs> statement about the talk. Right? We don't know, because we don't know who this guy is. The normal approach from NLP would be to remove all that <coughs> network structure. Here I was assuming it was a kind of dense network with all these connections. Uh, and just try to do this analysis in terms of the text. I think you'd be really good at doing it for this and this. And you'd be really lost at this point because it's just not a fact about that text, whether it's positive or negative. It can be read both ways. From the info lab perspective, the common thing to do would be to take that network structure, throw away all the textual data, and try to make predictions about missing edge labels based just on the ones that you have labels for. So that that, that connects with like sociological <coughs> how these networks form. You have principles like the friend of my friend is my friend. So if these two are positive, we can predict for that missing one that it's also positive. Or the enemy, the enemy of my friend is my friend. So if we had a plus here and a minus here, we could predict minus for that case and so forth. So that's a kind of triangle-based theory of these networks. The idea behind our model, the guiding intuition, is that we should unify those two things because there are strengths to be had on both sides. So returning to that ambiguous um, text, yeah, right, great talk. He didn't even talk about deep learning. Uh, if we know that this is a minus and this is a plus, even if this network edge is missing, we can infer from that social theory that that would be a minus and then use that information to make a prediction about what this text encodes. Right? And so in that case, we might get a kind of sarcastic read on the text uh, that we couldn't get before if we didn't know anything about the relationships between these two things. Uh, we could also do it the other way. So imagine we're missing this edge label there, but we know that that guy said that talk was amazing. Well, our textual sentiment model <coughs> is good enough that we can say that was an endorsement, infer a plus there, and then fill out the rest of the triangle even for this missing edge here. Right? So in that case, we're using the text get a better read on what the network is like. I think I'll wrap up by just saying a few things about the model that might be of interest. Again, this is a practical model in the sense that there are tools out there for fitting them and understanding them. Uh, the actual model is formulated like this, where we're balancing textual sentiment information with information we have about the edge label. Uh, and the task, as we framed it, is really to infer missing edge labels. But we do that in a way that might adjust or modulate the predictions of the textual sentiment model. So we're actually solving this constrained optimization problem that is trying not to deviate from what the textual sentiment model says and trying to adhere to the social theory of how these triangles are formed. As stated here, this model, this is um, intractable. It's an NP-complete problem. Um, but Liz de Tours group released this software called Probabilistic Soft Logic, which provides a relaxation of that um, intractable problem one that's convex. Uh, and that's a software package that you know, was well suited to the problem structure that we had. And so we just ran that, uh, and things worked really well. I'll leave it to you to look at the paper. We did experiments with understanding Wikipedia politics, where people vote for each other and also issue texts about why they voted the way they did. So we have the network edges and the textual information. And we did something similar with a collection of congressional debates and votes on the House floor of the US Congress. So just returning here, uh, I, I could say a lot more about interesting work that's happening with semantic composition in this first vein of sentiment analysis, but I think there's really exciting stuff to be done thinking about the contextual effects that I've covered here in this second part. So thank you. Hi, Dan. I had a question about how you got some of the edge data that you're using. So in the, in the diagram um, where you had the original writer and then a positive reviewer and then the guy with the height in the lower right, um, you were trying to 
predict that middle edge. Yeah. Uh, I can see how you would get to the positive edge across the top there. How did you know the other one, the vertical edge, between those two is yeah. positive? Right. So in that case, I can just make it up for that example. But more practically, for the uh, experiments that we did, for Wikipedia, we infer the edge label from how they voted on all these people. And then they, we have the texts that we can get a good read on with a sentiment analysis model. And then for the congressional debates, we infer that from their party membership, that they have positive or negative edge signs. And then again, we can get a read on, uh, they're making, it's, it's speech snippets that they made on the House floor. So it's all inferred, yeah. And that's why, I'm, by and large, for the experiments we did, we had a stronger sentiment model and a kind of very sparse social network graph. Uh, but the model is well suited for that setting. Quick follow-up question on that. So you're just using party membership as a proxy for, for independent status? That's what we have. Yeah, just the pluses and minuses. Have you considered looking at other ways of uh, kind of aligning people, like voting record, you know, people who vote on bill, you know, vote the same way on bills, maybe more aligned regardless of yeah, I'm, that's exciting, and that could lead to even more interesting things because you know we hear about the stuff that aligns with party membership, but you have a feeling that on the in the in Congress it's aligning with special interests and lobbyist friends and stuff right. like that. Right, dogs and, yeah, and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there are you know rhinos. Yeah, yeah, and th this could be a good model for that because if you have, have a strong textual sentiment model, if your network is weak or sparse, uh, the text part can um, recover from that a bit. That'd be the hope. Rhinos and blue dogs. I need to learn more about American politics. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if that's not a metaphor. That's true. <laughs> uh, you could have multiple edges, right? Like social media, Facebook data. Uh, if you use the like some membership liking of certain uh, pages as an affinity, then you, you can have multiple edges. Sure. Is yeah. there anything restricting using just adding more like, uh, edges to the network? Uh, I think the the data demands would get greater and the optimization would be harder, but I don't see any problem with adding additional sort of edge cost things and comparing them with whatever you have about the textual information. So that would be unexplored territory, but I like that idea. I'm curious about kind of combining these things, and I'm thinking about like conversations between people that probably are like family members, for example, where you see transitional states in conversations where well, now we're together and we're loving, but oh no, now I totally disagree with how you're living your life and I'm going to let you know, and, and these sorts of transitions. And I, I don't have a question per se, but I'm wondering about, is there something there about combining these and how might one think about transitions within conversations within established relationships? Oh yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that that's a new dimension, I would say, to this problem. And I, I don't know, just brainstorming here, you might want to think about those strong bonds, family bonds might tolerate more volatility than if you and I got on the phone, uh, then we, we need to sort of be more modulated. And that might be important for understanding everything that we say, right? Uh, uh, for between two family members, things that would be relationship ending really can't be, and so you can test that bond and it survives. Uh, that's an interesting dimension that would bring in even more social stuff than we've been able to. Um, so you talked earlier about um, using kind of voting records and kind of single dimensional things. We talked about like Facebook data and connections. And I guess what is, to me, this sounds a lot like just using other information that we have about the person. And so like if you know that this person is into these particular types of things, you don't know what their sentiment is in this particular thing, you can look at what other people with those particular interests generally tend to think and then apply that as a way to kind of shift the balance. But that sounds kind of more of a, it doesn't really seem exactly like a network problem. Um, because it's more kind of just like looking at variables and um, and kind of trying to almost like it's almost like a best fit problem. So how do you bring in like the network effects? Or, I don't know if that's a specific oh, enough. Question. I think I see what you mean. Yeah. So in the paper, we have this full model and then baselines that are like text only and triangles only. Yeah. Think of it that way. Uh, another baseline that's certainly worthwhile because it would be easier to optimize would be to just include the social network information as another set of predictors for your yeah. model, right? So you have some textual stuff and you have the social stuff, and I suspect that would be a pretty good approximation, mm -hmm. but I guess I would say it, I hope it doesn't do as well. Because it wouldn't, it wouldn't embody, I mean, this is attractive to me as a theorist, it wouldn't embody the social network theory of triangles that's behind that component of the model. Mm -hmm. um, if you were clever, you could approximate it. But I think it would be substantively different and worth trying out.
would probably would have been a good baseline for us. All right, thank you, Chris. Thanks.